Good afternoon. So thank you all for choosing our panel. We understand you had other choices. Um, so we're, we're happy to see you here. Um, <laughs> this panel is on the wellness program, specifically focusing on uh, workplace wellness programs. Um, as some of you might know, um, the U.S. wellness program industry um, is a nearly $6 billion industry. Um, and wellness programs uh, are programs uh, provided to employees uh, by employers, uh, usually private employers, uh, purporting to help the employees uh, achieve a healthier lifestyle um, through um, adhering to exercise regimes or nutritional guidelines, um, but they also are accompanied by medical exams and also uh, the collection of health data. From the employee. Now, there are studies that question the efficacy of wellness programs, <coughs> um, notably studies done by the Red Corporation. Um, but more troubling and, and, and perhaps more of concern to this panel um, is the potential for the misuse of the health data that is coming out of wellness programs, the health data that is being collected as part of uh, the wellness program. So more than two-thirds uh, of U.S.-based employers offer some type of wellness programs. And wellness programs can have um, several kinds of features, including the use of electronic, uh, electronic wearable devices um, to monitor um, physical activity. Um, and they also can have the collection of family medical history through questionnaires, as well as actual physical medical exams uh, measuring um, several health uh, indices uh, for the employee. Um, wellness programs in particular can offer things like weight loss, uh, weight loss or smoking cessation. Um, and when they offer those types of programs, they are allowed to offer incentives for the employees to join. So for a weight loss, uh, for a smoking cessation program, uh, the wellness program can offer up to a 30% reduction of the premium for, uh, to incentivize um, the employee to join. And then for a weight loss program, uh, the employer can offer up to a 50% reduction in premiums. Um, and if you imagine that someone might be paying up to, say, 10000 a year in uh, premiums, then that is a significant amount uh, of reduction. Uh, of interest, however, is that uh, weight loss and smoking are not protected categories under uh, the traditional uh, anti-discrimination laws for employment discrimination. So the fact that wellness programs, by incentivizing both weight loss or smoking cessation, is also in effect collecting information from employees that would help identify which employees have those types of issues, um, though that represents a potential both for uh, privacy violation, but even more importantly, employment discrimination on the basis of that status. Um, some of you might, might ask, well, what about the laws that protect health information? Um, does HIPAA uh, not protect the health information guarded from wellness programs. And a big issue is that wellness programs uh, are not always part of a healthcare provider system such that they may not actually be um, under the purview of HIPAA laws. Uh, so therefore, many wellness programs exist in a gray area when it comes to HIPAA. Um, and then when it comes to the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the American with Disabilities Act really only protects for um, what is called manifest disease, such that wellness programs that collect information about genetic data um, may actually uh, not be under the purview of, of the ADA. And then you might still think, well, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, um, that should be protective of health information that also happens to be genetic information as part of wellness programs. Um, and as my, uh, one of my panelists will explain in length, uh, that is not necessarily the case. 
So with, with just that overview, I want to go ahead and introduce um, the panelists um, that will be speaking with you today. Um, first of all, I, I guess I should probably introduce myself. Um, my name is Ifoma Ajinwa. I am a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University, and I am incoming uh, assistant professor at Cornell University's Industrial uh, and Labor Relations School. And I have written extensively on wellness programs and also on Gina's uh, shortcomings, uh, which is the Genetic Information Discrimination Act. To my immediate right is Dr. William uh, Pellin. And he has served uh, for seven years on the U.S. Senate staff, where he was senior health policy advisor to Senator Olympia Snow. His legislative work his legislative work on, um, on the Senate included uh, GINA, High Tech, and the Affordable Care Act. He subsequently directed creation of the Graduate Public Health Program at Marshall University, where he also served as Assistant Professor of Family Medicine and Associate Dean of Research in the College of Health Professions. And to going further down is Michelle Demieux. <laughs> Like Des Moines. Des Moines. Yeah. I that was, was actually a new one. That's why I laugh. Because normally it's Des Moines. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I know no, Michelle, so this is particularly embarrassing. <laughs> it's okay. She is director of the Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and, and Technology. She advocates for individual control and autonomy in digi digital systems and in policy. Michelle works with industry and other stakeholders to promote good data practices and researches emerging technologies that impacts personal uh, privacy. She leads uh, CDT's health privacy work, chairing the health privacy working group. Michelle's research has lately focused on data ethics in health, automated decision making in commercial health, and direct to consumer testing of genetic data. She has testified before Congress on health policy and is a frequent media contributor. And further down is Kate Black. Kate uh, is privacy officer and corporate counsel at 23andMe. She joined the company in 2015 and her work has focused on the security and privacy of the information of 23andMe uh, customers. Uh, prior to joining 23andMe, uh, Kate worked for the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology of the United States uh, Department of Health and Human Services here in Washington, D.C. Um, early in her career, she worked on health technology policy initiatives at the Office of Science and Technology at the White House, while also serving as a pro bono researcher for the World Health Organization. So uh, please welcome our panelists. So we'll proceed with presentations from each panelist, after which we'll have a Q&A. So um, we would like to ask you to hold your questions till all the panelists have had a chance to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, when I came to Washington in 2003, I came as a congressional fellow for the American Society for Microbiology. My expectation when I came to the Senate was to be working on science issues and, and primarily within my specialty of infectious disease. So, it came as quite a surprise to wind up working in civil rights issues, I would say, and that occurred both under high tech and GINA. I'm happy and pleased to be invited today to give a little perspective on the policy issues and sort of the legislative journey of the bill. Um, one question I heard in the Senate all the time from 2003 to 2008 when we finally achieved enactment was, why do we need GINA? And, and really disregarding the treatment of pre-existing conditions, which opens up a whole other can of worms on health reform, there weren't very many evident, there weren't many, very many instances or evidence of genetic discrimination. So you think of all the other civil rights bills that have been done, they were responsive to a problem which was evident and for which harm was being seen. With the exception of the Burlington Northern case, we really didn't have that. Um, but at the same time, around 1995, as we were beginning this project, an incredible explosion in terms of genetic science. I always go back to the Human Genome Project. Have we ever done a government project that came in ahead of schedule and under budget? This is a really remarkable thing that was occurring, and some of the members of Congress, 
I was working for Senator Olympia Snow at the time, got concerned because they were hearing two, two concerns. One was, will individuals participate in research if their individual genetic information could be used against them in some discriminatory way? The second question is, will people avail themselves of the science, the treatments, the testing, if they think that will be used against them in some way? So in 1995, Senator Snow and, and Representative Slaughter from the House introduced companion legislation, and several others followed on with that, to try to address the major concerns. And we always talk about, you know, scope and, and what should have been done. And in Washington, we use the expression a lot, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. I always wanted the perfect, but you learn that you're going to attack the things that you can do most readily and that have the greatest impact. Those things that we were looking at really were discrimination in the workplace and discrimination in terms of issuance of insurance. Now, Gina, to, to jump ahead just a moment here, Gina doesn't protect you from manifest disease. I was talking about pre-existing conditions. It's very clear in the bill that if that disease was already manifest, the protection doesn't exist. But if you had a genome or a genetic allele that may predispose you, we didn't want that to impact you in terms of your work or of your insurance. So the things that we didn't do, and at the time I thought we should, we didn't affect life insurance. We didn't affect disability insurance. We didn't affect long-term care insurance. In one case of one of those, it was, it was an ugly political thing that some of the members, I know my boss, had a major carrier who carried, who sponsored one of those kinds of policies. We didn't think we'd get that through. The other aspect, and you know, in hindsight, you also learn some other things. That you, those of you who've been in federal service know what's happened in long-term care coverage uh, in terms of premiums and adverse selection and so forth. So each of those kinds of insurance might have actually been disrupted, had some problem, inherent problems exacerbated if we included them in the gene of framework at that time. Um, the other thing that we dealt with quite a bit was the issue of how you, what existing structures do you use to create this new regime of protection? And at the time, what did we have in terms of management of health data? It was HIPAA. Um, I remember going to a, a health IT conference here with uh, Senator Kennedy's staff and a couple from the House, and I was the guy who stood up and said, we're going to have to revisit HIPAA. We're going to have to look at health privacy. And virtually everyone on the panel was like, no, this won't happen. A couple years later, of course, we actually did it. Uh, still, of course, not perhaps to our ideals of what we would like to do. Um, there was a 12-year march, and I wasn't there for all of it, coming in 2003. This bill was introduced in 1995. The Senate Companion came out early 1996. Twelve years later, we finally achieved enactment. The bill, um, I remember going to, we were talking about IA, IAPP. I went to one of the first meetings of that group, and they were proposing, oh, the, the Congress can take care of this problem or that problem. I said, we're nearing 12 years, we haven't gotten this bill passed. It passed the Senate twice, and it had been just died in the House, and we could not seem to iron out the, the problems. Um, in 2007, with a new Democratic majority, Senator Kennedy joined the Senator Snow and said, let's see if we can get this thing through. It was very interesting. Senator Kennedy, one of the most liberal members of the Senate, and Senator Enzi was one of the other Republican co-sponsors. He had the, the most liberal, the most conservative members. We actually got things done. But of course, like I said, you had to kind of go down and say, what's the most important thing? Let's protect people in terms of insurance and in terms of employment. Still, why did it take so long? Um, we really had some tough arguments to make, and I've written a little bit about this a few years ago back in the Atlantic when we were talking about health discrimination in general. Many individuals said, why do you have to act preemptively when there hasn't been appreciable discrimination shown? And I'm going to leave out that whole issue of pre-existing conditions and health insurance, because that was, you were opening the whole issue of health reform, and we weren't quite ready to do that at that time. The points I, I try to make repeatedly is that this is... Similar, but distinctively different from other kinds of discrimination. If you really look at it deeply enough, you can say a lot of discrimination, uh, sex, race, uh, and so forth, are genetic at their foundation. But what we're dealing with is, first of all, genetic information is immutable. 
and I, I love using that word, I heard Deb making that comment just a little while ago. You can't, as, as those in the law will say, unring the bell. Once the debt information is out there, it's out there, you can't undo it. This is really different for people in Congress who dealt with things like financial credit uh, privacy and control of that kind of information because you can default on a credit card and seven years later it's off your credit report. This doesn't ever go away. So we have that immutability. It's, it's also a, a little different than others in that it's, the discrimination itself is, tends to be covert. Uh, you might not recognize the genetic information being used against you. You know, in 1957, we realized there was race discrimination in professional baseball, and you could see it. But you can't, and you could see when it changed, but you can't necessarily see that with, with genetics. You may not even know you were discriminated against. And so that's, and there's so, nothing, in the third point, there's nothing subliminal about this because you actually have to go seek the information out. It's not that you're sitting across from a, an employment applicant and maybe you respond differently to men versus women. You're actually going into a database to try to retrieve information on which you could make a decision to discriminate, whether that be in the workplace or, or in health insurance. So if you have followed, especially, I don't think it's gotten better, the political debates we have these days, you can imagine that sitting down with members of Congress and their staffs who rotate on average every 18 months. That's the average duration of a staffer these days. You're trying to educate them about why we need to act preemptively and why this kind of discrimination is a bit different. So it, it meant not simply talking to staff members. It meant sitting on, I finally figured out I had to sit at night for a couple hours every night and talk to reporters all over the country and explain to them. They might have done reported on fashion six months before, and now they were reporting on health. And that became challenging. The other thing is that some people will fight battles on your bill. It was thought that we had such broad consensus that we'd be able to quickly pass this bill and get over to the House, and we'd get it passed in the House with, with uh, Speaker Pelosi leading her party, and we had a lot of support there. And then we, you know, those of you familiar with the Senate, there's a thing called the filibuster. I worked on a filibuster of the High Tech Act for years until we could finally get HIPAA provisions in. So I liked the filibuster, but on the other hand, Senator Coburn liked the filibuster too, and he held up Gina for years. Um, and they like to fight other battles in the bill. So if you can wind your clock back, if you remember or follow policy too much, we had a big discussion around 2006, 2007 about uh, the rights of uh, the unborn. That was the latest thing in, in, in the abortion choice uh, debate that we never really resolved. And so we wound up having the legal status of human fetus go dragging us on for, it must have been four or five months. We had issues come up about whether an HIV test was a genetic test. And at one point, I remember, I, I was doing dialogues via email with a physician member about, no, HIV test is done via antibodies or via virus test. It's not a genetic test. So people have other agendas, and they'll try to put those onto your bill, and they'll try to call it. It could cause it to die. Two lessons I learned from this that I think carry forward to high tech and to other things that we did. One is that when you're going to deal with health information, there's several strategies. Of course, we had some folks who wanted, sorry, we wanted to do, uh, broad access, we're, we're on that issue now, the broad access of employers to the information. I discovered where you can't simply ban improper use. And it was said, why don't you just list out everything people can't do with this information and then let employers and others be able to use the information. So you can prohibit the improper use, but you also have to control the information. And now we're even seeing greater challenges occurring because we're seeing the, the power of surrogacy where we can take other kinds of information and try to infer things, as was just mentioned in the last session. Uh, we're, we're definitely, you go to the target example and others, and you can see that. Uh, so 2008, we finally enacted the bill. And I explained one of the reasons why we controlled that information the way we did. And that is, Gina says nothing about using genetic information. If we, if we didn't contain the information, you wouldn't be able to use it to set a rate but you could sure decide who you were going to market your insurance to. Is that discrimination? Sure. There's always a creative way, especially you get enough clever, smart minds and lawyers they can figure out a way to do that. Uh, a quick advance to 2009, we finally do health reform, and then we get into the question of wellness. 
there was a big push on both sides of the aisle, but particularly on the Republican side, that you know, we want to contain costs, we make health care affordable. I said, well, we have to um, get people to change their behavior. And the GOP was mainly saying, we want people to have skin in the game, which I find a little bit odd because it's my life on the line when I'm talking about my health. But there were a lot of things that people wanted to put in in terms of these wellness provisions. And there was already under ERISA the ability to give some discounts or some rebates to folks. I think it was up to 20% of the, the premium cost for participation in a wellness program. But what we got here was something different. Now we have participation and we have outcome. And I, I was one of those in the gang of six that really opposed the outcome side. Um, Health contingent or outcome has to be reasonably designed. That's the rule. But there doesn't have to be any scientific record on what we do. I would always point to people, when I was growing up, both of my parents were hypertensive. Everyone was told back then, don't consume salt. Now we're finding out that only about 20% of individuals who are hypertensive are salt sensitive. So we've got to be really careful what information we decide we're going to use and, and penalize people on. But under this health contingent reward that's possible, there doesn't have to be any scientific record. It really can be on the sketchiest data. There's a lot of junk science here. The participatory programs are, are somewhat less objectionable, I would say. But I always map out the example of if you're a uh, single parent, for example, with a child, and you're working for $12, $15 an hour, and someone takes your premium, as you were alluding to earlier, you could have a $10,000 a year premium and 50% of that, with, with smoking, the secretary is allowed to make this a 50% penalty reward. Whether you call this penalty reward is kind of moot. You know, if you call it a, a reward, it's supposed to be okay. But in reality, if premiums go up here, and then if the people who don't have problems get a 50% discount, it, it, it doesn't matter what label you put on it. Uh, you have, wind up putting people in a very, very difficult um, circumstance. Uh, I'm not going to go too much longer than that. I want to make a couple of points here and, and let, let next speaker go. Um, there's been moves to say we need to expand gene. And I think we know in the current atmosphere that's not likely to happen. We're not going to expand to the other classes of insurance. The idea of disparate impact, and I know you've written on this a little bit, I'm intrigued by it. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I always have to put that out there. I think I always have this issue about the scientific evidence for the cause-effect relationship when you rely on disparate impact. The thing that I think has been really great, there is no private cause of action in, in GINA. So we couldn't, uh, you couldn't receive any uh, compensation if you were discriminated against directly of any consequence. But the thing that's been really great is under HIPAA at least, the Obama administration we had no penalties for a HIPAA violation right up through we did High Tech Act. Um, on the flip side, those are the pos those are the positive things that could be or done and have been done. On the negative side, we've got a bill in the House, uh, HR 1313, which I could talk at great length about, but I think it's it's kind of not as important as the fact that it's basically enabling legislation to let the employers have the data. But basically, the Affordable Care Act is the thing that set this up. So I'm less yeah, yes, it, and it'll probably, I would expect it probably pass, but the preamble of the bill, if you ever pick it up and read it, says 50%. So we're looking at charging some people $100, another person $50. And can you get uh, exemption if you can't achieve the numbers that you're specified by your wellness program? Well, you can, but we also know that, you know, some people will never get that doctor's note, or they'll lag, or they'll miss the deadline. Under this new bill, you've got 45 days to act. Uh, and there was an amendment actually offered. It's been through one committee already. It failed on a party line vote, 17 to 22, to ban the employer from subsequently selling that information. So what we're, what, what's really the intent of this if you don't support the idea of banning the resale of that information? I think that the bottom line in terms of the policy and, and, the, and the legal issue here is that the incentives offered in the ACA, and I would maintain, they're inherently coercive and they're not voluntary, especially at those percentages. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you structure this as a penalty or an incentive. Um, and, the, and the use of outcomes, we're talking about genetics. If, if you and I both have hyperlipidemia and we both take Lipitor and my numbers go down to the 
the objective number and yours don't, is that not the, if we both take our medication, is that not the definition of genetic outcome or likely genetic outcome? Just disparate impact. Disparate impact, exactly. <laughs> disparate impact. Um, so on that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass this along. Uh, I think that what we're dealing with, though, here is an erosion, not, all, and not only attempt to erode the gene protections, but it, a broader attempt in terms of what we do in terms of pooling risk under insurance and community rating and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's connected in, in that way. Thank you. That was, I think, fascinating to get a glimpse into how all of that, all of that happened. Someone wants to describe to me the wellness fever that swept through the White House during that time. And another person said that everybody in the White House um, drank the Kool-Aid and believed that wellness was the future of there, the prevention of health of everything. There, there, was a, there was a joke that Senator Ensign in the Senate Finance Committee had, had a bromance with Steve Byrd at Safeway. Safeway kept getting, getting thrown up to us again and again as, as look at the success they've had with wellness. Is that right? Well, there's, there's Bird Health now, too. He went on to start a wellness-focused <laughs> employer company uh, out in the valley. Okay. All right. <laughs> this is very interesting. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I was going to end my presentation speaking about HR 1313, but I will just briefly comment, because I, I think Bill kind of went over most of it, and say that part of the reason it hasn't passed yet is because of the public. Because there was a huge public outcry, you know, a lot of advocates um, were pressuring the Congress, were sending letters, the media was, was really pressuring them, and people were outraged because, of course, we were. You know, we, we expect the ADA and GINA to protect information from our employers um, to the extent that they do, and this law would have taken that away. So um, I'm saying that as sort of a rallying cry to, to pay attention and to be active on it because it really does matter. Um, so my role on the panel, I think, is to give you a little bit of a sense of why this matters to you and what the, what the sort of inherent problems are in the structure of these programs. Um, so I'll, I'll go over a little bit, but um, first I was going to ask a question and ask who has an activity tracker here? Right? Okay, well actually the answer is all of us, right? Does everybody have a smartphone? And part of the reason I, I make that kind of dumb joke is to identify for you how unexpected sometimes data collection is. Um, and, and then I want you to think for a second about your phone and what your employer could learn about you by looking at everything on your phone. And if, if you're most people, that's a disquieting thought. Not because you're a terrorist or you have some nefarious thing you do, but the, the fact that this is all information that is under your expectation of a certain amount of privacy. I think we all know now that apps and operating systems and everything else are getting data about us, but you still have a sense that it's cabined from your employer at the very least, right? So these programs are a way that that, is, that line is being blurred. Um, it's, the employee wellness programs are really, in my mind, a cost-shifting mechanism. They, you know, employers are facing a lot of cost in health insurance. We all know that. And, and, and not to, you know, under, it's a really big problem. You know, small businesses are struggling with this. And so when wellness programs came along, it was very, and still is, extremely attractive to them because it's the idea of taking the burden of the cost and shifting it onto you. And really, the way that the programs are being implemented now using technology, wearables, all kinds of uh, different devices, they're looking for who's going to cost them money. And that's also something that defies a lot of people's expectations when they go into these programs. You know, and it's not because anybody is trying to, again, there's no necessarily nefarious you know, activity going on, but it's that a lot of times employers don't have the information to, to say to their employees, hey, we're going to look at all of this and figure out if you're going to cost us money. And we're going to use different mechanisms to mitigate that cost. And mostly we're going to give it back to you and make you pay for it. So one of the things I want to point out about the problems with the incentives, sorry, my notes are on here, um, is that when you think about 30%, what that looks like to somebody sitting in the CEO's office versus somebody sitting in, in the administrative assistant seat is very different. And this speaks to some of the, the health, you know, the disparate impact that occurs here. 
but the economic underpinning of the way that these programs works can be huge. If you're in a workplace and you refuse to do it because you don't want to give your employer the ability to do a biometric screening, to do a genetic screening, to do a health risk assessment, to ask you questions like, were you happier yesterday than today? Did you have any depression yesterday? Did you have moments of sadness yesterday? You know, things that are going to make decisions about how much you pay and about what your employer knows about you. And we all know just from hearing that those are real questions. That, that that's patently ridiculous. Of course, you know, we, maybe I was really sad yesterday. That doesn't mean I'm, I, I would be diagnosed as depressed. So there's all kinds of problems. And then the money part just kind of makes that even worse. Um, basically, what you end up having, in my opinion, is the under-resourced colleagues subsidizing the more resourced colleagues. So to put this into more focus, for example, the metrics that Bill mentioned, you know, a lot of the ways that they measure how well you've done in these programs are outdated. We're talking about BMI, right? BMI has essentially been debunked in a lot of ways because it's, it doesn't measure things like muscle. It doesn't, you know, it, it could call somebody obese who is just very muscular. And, and that creates all kinds of problems in terms of the recommendations that these programs are giving. But also it doesn't recognize cultural differences. There are cultural differences when it comes to BMI. There are differences in body types. There are differences in our genetics that determine those things. And yet, the only metric being looked at is that number. So again, this to me is another disparate impact where you have people of different cultures being penalized for something that is not within their control. Similarly, if you think about the way, so if the programs are, for example, trying to get you to lose weight, which you would think on the surface is a good goal, and of course it is, right? We should, we should be healthy, we should do things. But what does that take? And many times in the programs, what that takes is going to the gym, right? Or, or maybe using your fitness tracker, maybe eating healthier food. That's an important part of, of losing weight and being healthy. The problem is if you come from a neighborhood where healthy food is hard to find, and as most of you probably know, that exists all across this country, that isn't measured. Or if, for example, you can't go to the gym because they don't have a childcare um, center, or you don't have a car and you need to, to take the bus. You know, there are lots of ways in which economics and um, other factors are just not brought into these programs. And so I think as I'm painting this picture, I hope what you're seeing is that they really are about the money and shifting it onto the employees and not the employers. Um, finally, I just want to talk a little bit about the gamification and the nudging that occurs. So a lot of apps and devices use behavioral nudges. It's all, it's, it's happened since the beginning of marketing, right? You, we, we try to give you some way to influence what you're going to do. And so more and more, a lot of employee wellness programs are, are using nudges to say, hey, great job, you get a star. Great, you know, you, you went to the gym or you did this or that. The problem with those, of course, is that activity trackers, for example, are notoriously inaccurate, right? And my friends at Fitbit would cringe to hear me say this, but it's true. Um, they're also unreliable. We all know that we forget about them after two weeks. Also something they would cringe, I think, to hear, but is also true. Um, so there are lots of issues with the devices that are being used in these programs. And of course, they're also being used as incentives. So you get a free wearable if you join this program, but then again, you're getting a wearable that may or may not actually serve your interests, if it's inaccurate or it's somehow unreliable. Um, and then finally, I want to just mention the, the comment that you made about health contingent wellness programs not being based on scientific evidence. I think that's a huge problem. You know, what we're talking about when we talk about health is privacy, sort of the core foundational values of healthcare are privacy and ethics in a lot of ways. Do no harm, right? Without scientific evidence to back up these outcomes or the different recommendations that people are getting, there's no way to validate that this is even working. And in fact, a lot of programs, a lot of, or some studies have come forward and said, not only are these not working, they're harming people. So if you were in a smoking cessation program, one study found, a few months later, you ended up smoking again, which can actually be worse for you. If you were in a weight loss program, a few months later, you ended up gaining more weight. So that, that sort of foundational principle of do no harm and, and the ethical considerations that are baked into healthcare get sort of violated, I think, by some of these programs. Um, and then finally, if you are using, if you're an employer and you're using a vendor, which is what many of them do, 
you have a third party vendor come in and they administer the program because of course many employers don't have the capacity to do this. So what governs the data that they get from you, this highly, highly sensitive data from you, including genetic information, is governed not by HIPAA, not by ADA. Does anyone know what it's governed by? Terms of service. The terms of service, the privacy policy, which is really a data sharing policy for the most part. And you know, there's no, and some programs, some vendors try really hard to be protected to the extent that they can. You know, employers still are limited in what they can see. But you have to put that in context of, say, you're a 10 person uh, agency, and your employer looks, and, and there's only one of you that's pregnant, and you know, that's kind of easy to identify. So, so even the minor protections that would come into play are, are pretty much um, null when it comes to using third party vendors. So that's my, my final point. So hopefully I've made you all extremely paranoid. That's <laughs> most of my job. But I will say, if you do have an employee wellness program, if it's something that you are enrolled in, you should ask your employer about the privacy protections. Because again, this is not necessarily something that employers know. They may, they're not trying to necessarily violate your privacy. But from my experience, they don't necessarily, haven't asked the right questions that you could ask. And say, what are you doing with this data? How can I be sure that you're not using this against me? You know, what, what's this vendor doing? How are they, they de-identifying the data? It's something that I'm comfortable with. All of those questions, I think the more that we ask our employers those questions, the more it will become apparent how very important um, protecting the privacy of the data is and the integrity of, of healthcare. I'm sure everyone's now very comfortable buying a kit and participating <laughs> in our program. Um, you know, I, I think all of the things are really very set up. Frankly, uh, we sit in the middle of a lot of these things. So as most of you know, we are a direct-to-consumer product um, that has a lot of genetic data. We are also an employer um, who tests all of our employees um, completely voluntarily. But as you can imagine, if you're an employee of our company, you're super interested in genetic testing um, and want to become a customer. And we also sell and distribute through these wellness programs, so uh, we toss around a lot of these questions every day. Uh, and I'd like to talk through each one of those topics, but I think before I do, it's probably helpful to level set a little bit, give you some background on who we are as a company, how the product works, um, and how all this kind of back end and, and big data related questions really play out. Um, so we have about 2 million customers now. Uh, 23andMe was founded 11 years ago, so if you think about the world 11 years ago, it was a very different place, um, especially on the timeline for Gina Passage. Um, it gets to be quite interesting what 2006 looked like. Um, but we've grown steadily. We've had a number of setbacks as we're made very public, but at this point, we can offer a pretty full product on both the ancestry and health side. So we can tell you all kinds of information from uh, you know, where your ancestors were from, what year they likely moved to that region of the world, um, to wellness information, like what eye color you should have, how you react to uh, caffeine, if you're a morning person or a night person, and a lot of heavier health information. Uh, we recently got clearance from the FDA to let folks know about their Parkinson's and Alzheimer's status. So we call that the bucket of things that are genetic health risks or may impact um, heavier health conditions. And also provide you a number of tools to connect with other people, compare your traits, um, and participate in our voluntary research program, which is overseen by an IRB, um, an external ethics board, but really allows us to look at all of that data, um, understand all sorts of research questions in combination with your genetic information to better tackle diseases, understand the genetic relation between um, anything from uh, ethnic identity to um, you know how Parkinson's progresses through the phases of the uh, disease. So it is really quite interesting. And then most recently have launched a therapeutics team that will now also use that information, as you kind of alluded to, to see um, what the kind of personalized medicine and uh, pharmaceutical drug options look like. So that if we can tailor drugs to be specifically built around you as an individual and make sure that they work for you based on your genetics, will move uh, the response rate from about 60% on the average drug today to closer to 90 to 95% in the future. Um, so really a ton of interesting questions, a lot of really um, sensitive and complicated sets of data that move through our product. Um, one interesting facet of that is when you get a genetic test, you're not just getting a genetic test for yourself. All that information is pretty transferable to all of the members of your family. So um, I can very quickly tell all of my siblings and my parents very sensitive pieces of information about themselves just by virtue of the fact that I took the test. 
Um, and that's not only things that I could glean, but any third party that got a result or got uh, uh, access to my result could also very easily tell that, you know, my brother is likely to carry the uh, Alzheimer's genes or whatever the case may be. Um, so it's really important to understand that these risks don't even just pertain to yourself in a lot of ways, but they also pertain to the people in your community um, and heightened when those members of your community are uh, fairly closed off or a kind of minority race or ethnicity that may have things that um, frankly are uh, more highly discriminated against in our country or wherever you reside. And think so with that, it's very important to us that we communicate these risks and manage the data in a way that is as protectionary as we can, uh, that also understands that um, we want to put our customers in a position to make these decisions for themselves and set their own risk tolerance and navigate the space of online genetics in whatever way makes sense for them. So I uh, don't want to make those kind of preemptive decisions for people, um, but also understand it's really hard to educate folks at a degree that would, this would all make sense to them as they kind of log in online and see this stuff. Um, so as an employer, we again offer all of our employees the opportunity to take a genetic test. So they all do. Um, that information is completely bifurcated, so we don't ever really know if the employee took the test or what the results were. There are often times where an employee will like share their results at the like news kind of forum internally to say like, hey, look at our new product feature. This is how my results look. Um, and all that information we empower people to do in a very open way, um, but don't use it, again, for any employment-related decisions. And in fact, our HR team is like specifically walled off from some of those news channels just because we want people to feel comfortable doing that and sharing. And as a health company, I think everyone is very pro-health and pro-engaging in conversations about health tools and information they've learned. Um, but we want to make sure that we index on the side of uh, protection in terms of their employment status. Um, our customers are super worried about this. I'd say the third highest question we get asked is, will I get discriminated against if I take your test? And if so, how? Uh, so there's a number of tools throughout the website that we use to try to educate folks about GINA and the limitations of GINA. We have some state level resources as well, because California is more protectionary than other states, but it can be very complicated and change very quickly in um, a lot of jurisdictions. So especially now, I try to pick that up. Um, and we also put up kind of a just-in-time notification as people are signing up to give them a uh, kind of link and source out to other materials. Uh, just beyond genetic discrimination, there's like five things that customers are really worried about. Uh, law enforcement access, government access is one of those. Finding out that their dad is not their dad is another. So any of the things that come up a lot, we, we really do try to communicate about. But, um, you know, also in line with our brand, like don't want to make it scary or make it seem as though it's a larger burden than it is. So I have to always work to find a communication strategy that's kind of even keeled and informative, but um, doesn't increase the creep factor of an online genetic test too much, as we are already pretty creepy. Um, and then finally, you know, I think where things get really complicated for us is when there are channels and that the test is being sold kind of out of our direct-to-consumer arm, we want to make sure that the protections kind of flow with the kit itself and uh, maintain our quality and our standards. But it's fairly difficult to do. Um, we do distribute through some of the wellness programs and offerings that, that you mentioned. All of our agreements with those organizations um, include a lot of the very like, genome-focused language, like you will not share the information back with the employer. The employer cannot know whether or not the individual has taken the test. Um, there can be no employment-related questions in any of the like sign-up or registration for your kid, um, and all that kind of stuff. So in a structure where like you get points back for participating, what we'll do is put the kit in a menu of like five different items that are about cost competitive. Uh, Fitbit is sometimes one of them. And the employer will get an alert or the system will know that you've chosen one or five of those products and you get points as a result of that. But they won't know which one and they won't know kind of what you've done with that product downstream. And so once the person does buy a kit uh, through that employee wellness channel, they really are just buying a code um, and they take that code directly back to us and our online portal register their own kit, buy everything, fill out all their information, and basically become a traditional customer without any interaction or any knowledge on their um, employees or employer's side. So we, feel, we do feel pretty good about that, um, but we have received a lot of pushback. A lot of the wellness programs aren't comfortable with those terms of use. Rather than uh, outcome-based, 
um, because I think a lot of the outcome base and consensus are really about cost shifting, whereas if it's more a participatory one, then it's actually more caring about public health. Um, so I think a single payer system would shift. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Happy to also answer them offline yes. if you guys want to. I know the next video. panel is start starting. Yeah, so exactly. thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much for our panel.